On June 5, 1945, the 21st Bomber Command of the United States 20th Air Force directed a bombing run against the city of Kobe. This was not the first mission to have been flown over Kobe. There had been previous raids in February and March. The tactical report for the June mission stated that the total destruction across the city had expanded to 8.75 square miles. 56% of Kobe was now destroyed, as framed in this neat little table here. The incendiary zone that was targeted included ports and heavy wartime industry, but it also included the commercial district and densely built up areas. The zone also included two residential areas described as, quote, highly inflammable. These were prime targets for the magnesium bombs chosen to confound firefighters. But not included in the report's description was a boy, a 14-year-old boy living in the city named Akiyuki Nosaka. Akiyuki's mother died shortly after giving birth to him in 1930. His wealthy father was very distant, so he lived with his aunt and uncle as foster parents. They had adopted an infant in 1941 who died of illness, and then adopted again in 1944, a baby girl named Keiko. When the bombs fell on June 5th, 1945, Nosaka raced to get water. When he returned, the front of the house was in flames. He called out to his foster parents, but then ran away. In the hillside bomb shelter a mile away, Akiyuki could look out and see that Kobe had been destroyed, and that a great curtain of orange flames from which golden embers rained down constantly hung over the smoldering ruins. He was eventually reunited with his family at the National Elementary School. His foster mother was covered in severe burns and had to be taken by a rickshaw to a hospital. His foster father had disappeared in the blaze, almost certainly killed leaving the 18-month-old Keiko in Akiyuki's care. The pair moved in with an old widow, but it was a tense stay. Traumatized by the attack he had already lived through, whenever Nosaka heard air raid sirens, he would immediately flee with Keiko to the nearby bomb shelter. The neighbors accused Nosaka of cowardice for running instead of staying to help with firefighting. To make matters worse, a hunger crisis was steepening across the home islands. The intense rationing of the imperial economy meant food was scarce. According to the United States government, prior to Pearl Harbor, the average per capita caloric intake of the Japanese people was about 2,000 calories as against 3,400 in the United States. By 1944, the average per capita caloric intake had declined to approximately 1,900 calories. By the summer of 1945, it was 1,680 calories per capita. The average diet suffered even more drastically from reductions in fats, vitamins, and minerals. Keiko began to suffer from malnutrition. It would prompt her to cry a lot, even at nighttime. Nosaka would have to take her outside to avoid disturbing the others, and he confessed that he would resort to hitting her until she quieted. Eventually, there was an incident between Nosaka's grandmother and the widow. His grandmother accused the widow of stealing things that belonged to the family. In return, the widow moved their possessions into the hallway and told Nosaka to take them to the bomb shelter for safekeeping if they were really that valuable. And so for about a month, he and Keiko lived at the bomb shelter. And in that time, Nosaka struggled to care for the infant as conditions worsened. In desperation, he found himself eating food as soon as he found it, instead of saving any for his sister. He described himself as a gaki, a greedy ghost cursed to forever hunger. Nosaka would raise a spoonful of soup to blow on it to cool for her, and then find himself putting it in his own mouth. I loved her, he later said, but my gluttony overrode my affection and concern for her. On August 21st, Keiko succumbed to starvation and died. Nosaka cremated her remains before rejoining his foster mother and grandmother in Osaka, telling them Keiko had died in an air raid. Over the next couple of years, Nosaka dropped out of school and lived on the streets, positioning himself as a pimp serving American soldiers during the occupation. In 1947, he was caught stealing clothes in Tokyo and was detained along with other boys, many of them Senso Koji, war orphans. For almost two months, he languished in a cell, which was unusual. All that was needed to release him was to have a guardian show up on his behalf, and his foster mother was alive. Yet, his foster family did not come for him. The cell had no furniture, no toilet only a bucket for the boys to relieve themselves in. Nosaka saw the boys wither away and die before his eyes, and he realized he would also die here if he didn't get out. 
Eventually, in desperation, he petitioned his biological father for rescue, and he immediately arrived in Tokyo, rescuing Akiyuki from the cell. But looking back, Nosaka describes feeling like he was abandoning his cellmates, forgetting about them, almost certain to die in captivity while he was whisked away to a life of affluence. The guilt over them, the guilt for running away from his burning home, and the guilt for Keiko would haunt him for the rest of his life. Nosaka would return to his studies and go on to university, where he began a career as a writer. He wrote songs and scripts for commercials through school. In 1963, he won the Japan Record Award for the children's song, Toys Dance the Cha-Cha. That same year, he debuted as a novelist with his book, The Pornographers, which was quickly adapted into a feature film. Nosaka would go on to have an eclectic career, at turns a singer, a columnist, an activist, and was even eventually elected to the Japanese House of Counselors. But for years, he was also a liar. He presented himself as a war orphan, describing himself as the only survivor of his household on the fateful June 5th attack. It was easy to explain, easier to sympathize with, and deflected scrutiny off of his past. But his past would soon catch up with him. In 1964, he had a daughter named Mao, and as she neared Keiko's age, an unusual change came over Nosaka. He would become, quote, irrationally agitated when Mao refused to finish her meals or eat all of her sweets. Nosaka became paranoid that Mao would stop breathing and die in her sleep. He would have visions of his house and family going up in flames. It became so unbearable to see his daughter that he took three months living away from home. He wrote, Mao is now about the same age my unfortunate sisters were when they died, and their images overlap. I feel unqualified to be Mao's father, and I wonder how long I'll be able to look after her and protect her. At this time, the Second Indochina War was escalating. The United States became more and more involved through the 60s. News programs were flooded with the images of Vietnamese cities and villages burning, with the searing visuals of napalm and its grisly aftermath. Akiyuki Nosaka found himself surrounded by reminders of his trauma, and in response, he decided to write about it. In 1967, he published a number of pieces about his experiences related to the war. A Playboy's Nursery Songs served as one of the earliest factual accounts of his war experience. His short story, American Hijiki, details the complex feelings he had toward the United States. After all, he grew up seeing them framed as first a foreign enemy, and then suddenly benefactors. But perhaps his most well-known work, not just of that year, but his life, is the 1967 short story Hotaru no Haka, translated in the Japan Quarterly a decade later by James R. Abrams with the English title, A Grave of Fireflies. The story is a loose adaptation of Akiyuki Nosaka's experience with the firebombs and with Keiko. Its protagonist, a teenage boy named Seita, is left to care for his little sister Setsuko when their mother is killed. In many of its plot beats, it follows Nosaka's own experience. They move in with a widow and her family, and are granted extra food by the state since their father is in the navy, an arrangement that their host seems resentful of. The widow declared, The navy's got it so good, getting to use trucks to carry things. Hard to tell if she was being sarcastic. As he was piling it up in the entranceway, this time to the widow, it's only the military families that are living high, repeated her complaining. With an expression of pure delight, she lorded over the goods, even giving out pickled plums to the neighbors. Over time, those resources prove inadequate to their host, who demands to know when the children will make themselves useful. Seta spends his time caring for Setsuko, but that's not enough to prove themselves worthy of the food they themselves handed to her. Unable to stomach the abuse, Seta and Setsuko eventually strike out on their own, using whatever resources they have to try to survive. But the situation grows more and more desperate, the famine worsened by a poor harvest for the year. Seta resorts to stealing crops and is caught, only saved from punishment by a sympathetic policeman. But that rare spot of sympathy cannot be eaten. It cannot nourish Setsuko's body, and so she dies. Again, very similar to Nosaka's lived experience. 
but it has several important changes. The family ties are simplified. Seda lives with his birth mother and sister, with his birth father an active officer in the war. While Keiko had been only 18 months old when she died, the fictional Setsuko is four years old. This allows her to better communicate her wants and needs through the story. But most notably, Seta does a far better job as caregiver, going beyond what Nosaka himself had done. Nosaka fled from the burning home. Seta tries to lead his mother to safety. Nosaka ate his sister's food. Seta shares whatever he can find, and even muses about cutting off his own finger to sustain his sister. Nosaka was saved by his rich father from the Tokyo cells. Seta dies in a subway station and is given a communal cremation. It's a work with raw, powerful emotions. Nosaka described his experience writing it like he was possessed. I let my hand do the thinking and sent it off without revision. Translated into English, the effect is achieved with long, run-on sentences, clauses strung together, a perfect example of stream-of-consciousness-style storytelling. The work is also riddled with grisly and grotesque details, capturing the sense of grim desperation and eventually defeat. And with the added context of Nosaka's own experience, it's easy to see him wrestling with grief and guilt. A Grave of Fireflies is a tragic wish-fulfillment story, and you can feel Nosaka's remorse for what he failed to do. These stories began a turning point in Nosaka's life, with him finally speaking honestly about his past. He turned his activism towards defending the anti-war components of Japan's new constitution, and when he ran for office in 1974, his slogan was, I never want to see a starving child again. Nosaka won the Naoki Prize for both A Grave of Fireflies and American Hijiki. Many offers to adapt the former into a movie came his way, but how would they depict the charred earth faithfully? How could a child actor capture the desperation, the starvation that was setting in? And that's when an offer came in from Isao Takahata. Takahata was nine years old when, on June 29th, 1945, he also experienced a bombing raid on his hometown of Okayama. During the firebombing, he and his older sister, who'd been badly burned and scarred, were separated from the parents for two days. He called it the worst experience of his life. Takahata ended up building a long and storied career in animation. In 1985, he and fellow animator Hayao Miyazaki co-founded the famous Studio Ghibli, to this day one of the most revered studios in the world. Three years later, Takahata directed and screenwrote an adaptation of Hutaru no Haka, an English titled Grave of the Fireflies. Akiyuki Nosaka's story was in someone else's hands for the first time, and under Takahata's careful direction, he would not only transform the story for audiences, but also for Nosaka himself. Just like the short story, the film opens at the end of the narrative. <laughs> We see Seda's final moments in a subway station, with people dismissing him and voicing concerns only about what the incoming American occupation will think of this site. When his body is searched, all that's found of note is an empty candy tin. It's a remarkably faithful adaptation. Nervous from holding the can of drops, he shook it, a rattling sound, then the station man with the pitcher's wind-up hurled it into the darkness of the burnt-out ruins in front of the station. The lid popped off, a white powder spilled out, the fragments of three small bones rolled away, waking the fireflies hidden within the grass, and a flurry of twenty, thirty of them flying back and forth, flashing on and off, then quiet. The white bones were those of Seta's younger sister, Setsuko. Seta joins her, and the two walk away hand in hand, boarding a train and starting to pass through the memories of how they got to this point. And it's with this framing that the story unfolds very faithfully to how Nosaga had written it, hitting all the major plot points, but in a slightly different way. The written text again has an almost breathless, feverish quality to it. Meanwhile, Takahata's direction keeps things at a smoother pace, with the siblings' review of their memories coming in at various points to add retrospective regrets to key moments, adding more emotional layers to them. The movie is very deceptively simple to synopsize. I've hit most of its major beats in my description so far, and it might seem an impossible task to fill a feature film's length with a story. It can seem slow, but it's a film where a lot of moments occur. A lot of small, personal, human moments. 
And Iesau Takahata is nothing if not a master of capturing small, deceptively simple human moments and imbibing them with powerful layers of subtlety. His career demonstrates a jaw-dropping ability to evoke tension and relief, tragedy and joy from the simplest moments. Grave of the Fireflies is just one of the masterworks he has directed. And to see how succinctly he approaches his craft, Look at how the film adapts this passage in the story. This is shortly after Seta and Setsuko's mother has been fatally wounded. Seta talks to Setsuko. You wanna eat? I wanna go where Mama is. Tomorrow we'll go. It's already late. He sat at the edge of the sandbox. Give it a try. Watch this, your brother's an expert. Seta sprang onto the horizontal bar with a great swing pulling his body up onto it and began spinning around, round and round without end. In the film, Seta tells the sister that she can't see Mama right now, and at this news, she looks away awkwardly. Complex emotions fill her face as she's asked to cope with so much in so short a time. She saw the bombs fall, she saw the fire roar through her home, she saw the devastation. This final disappointment is her breaking point. But she's not a wide-eyed fawn or a wailing infant. She's silent, struggling to process everything. Seta takes her cue to step away unsure how to help. Her tears are non-dramatized and paradoxically hit all the harder. Takahata's direction creates incredibly empathetic characters in all his films, and this is one of the most powerful examples. Brother and sister sit apart, together, trying to figure out what to do next, until Seda suddenly hops up. <laughs> In this simple scene, with only one line of dialogue, everything is established between Seda and Setsuko. Their relationship is at the heart of this movie, of the story. Seda will do all he can to provide for his little sister and to protect her. Even if all he can do is try to distract and delight her, even if it's almost entirely ineffective, he will try. Takahata brings this to life for Nosaka. In 1987, An America published this interview with Nosaka and Takahata, where Nosaka himself says that, I hate so-called anti-war movies. And I think what he's referring to is an unfortunate tendency in anti-war movies to try to have their cake and eat it too. They pay lip service to a message, and maybe even have the story actually support that message. But they also face pressure to put spectacle on the screen. Yes, Rambo was exploited and abused and discarded by the federal government, but isn't it so cool when he makes the gas station go boom? In Grave of the Fireflies, there are relatively few scenes of the war. And it's not even an exchange of blows, it's an entirely one-sided deluge of hell from the skies. Notice how when we see the first bombs fall, they don't explode. This is not only historically accurate, but it denies the spectacle of war to the viewer. Far more emphasis is placed on the people affected by the carnage than the carnage itself. It's worth noting too that this movie also lacks a revanchist spirit. In fact, it seems intent on dispelling any notion of revenge. In these scenes, the closest we get is this lone man crying out. But notice the visual language here. Rather than having him large and imposing in the frame, he's small, feeble, even foolhardy for this action. Also notice the mop he's holding as part of the fire brigade's equipment. Fires are actively burning around them, and rather than use a tool specifically designed to fight these fires, to fight the fires, it's instead waved about in an empty proclamation. The film frames this as a futile and foolhardy attitude, because by this point, the war effort as a whole is similarly pointless. In the West, we often recognize the start of World War II to be 1939 with the German invasion of Poland. But in East Asia, the Second Sino-Japanese War had started in earnest in 1937, and it's often considered to have started as early as 1931 with Japan's invasion of Manchuria, hence the name the Fifteen Years' War. During this time, Japan was led by an emperor, but the keys to his power lay in an oligarchy of military leaders. Foremost among these had been Hideki Tojo, who had once held the roles of Prime Minister, Minister of War, and Chief of Staff of the Army. In July 1944, however, he was forced to resign following the Japanese defeat at Saipan. One year later, the Supreme Council for the Direction of the War hung in a delicate balance. The Prime Minister, Foreign Minister, and Navy Minister were ready to declare an unconditional surrender. 
The Army Minister, Army Chief of Staff, and Navy Chief of Staff similarly realized the war was lost, but wanted to hold out in order to negotiate terms with the Allied forces. And we see this reflected in the film. Again, this kind of quiet protest here. Sita quietly thinks to himself about how his father is going to make the enemy pay for these attacks, and then come back and save his family. And in their hideout, Seda reminisces about a time he saw a naval display, remembering the bravado he had felt. And for a moment, he feels that patriotic surge through him again. But he's too young to even understand what he's cheering for. To him, the war is about the spectacle of huge ships and brass bands and flashing lights. It's about his father, whom he admires, being involved in something prestigious. But as he falls quiet again in the cave, we see that maybe he doesn't fully believe in it, as strongly as he says. Because the war, of course, isn't about huge ships and brass bands and flashing lights. The 15 years war had started was always intended as expansionist conquest, seeking to erect a new order across the Pacific, with Imperial Japan as its sovereign master. And in the name of this new order, millions were slaughtered, with the numbers reaching upwards of 20 million Chinese soldiers and civilians. Thousands of Korean women and girls, as well as other ethnicities, were forced into sexual slavery for the occupying Japanese soldiers. The infamous Nanjing Massacre saw 200,000 prisoners and civilians slaughtered. The general involved hanged in 1948 for crimes against humanity. Unit 731 developed biological and chemical weapons and ran human experimentation on victims as young as infants. The men involved were pardoned by the United States in exchange for contributions to their own research. It's important to understand that this was an offensive, empire-building war layered with horrific atrocities. This is the war that the government of Japan is squeezing its people to support. This is the war that Seda and Setsuko's aunt expects them to contribute to. Because here's the truth about a society structured like this. At first, Setsuko and Seda are treated with a major of charity. The aunt takes them in gladly, especially with the generous stipend they get by virtue of being the children of a soldier. <laughs> but when Seda reveals to the woman that their mother was actually killed, you can see the expression on her face change. And over time, the charity fades, as there's a new expectation to be useful. The movie highlights this particular aspect of the story. Maki Kanichi, a Japanese wartime social worker, framed it like this. Those who are involved in the work of the protection of children must look at them as seeds for the nation, who are the talented and useful human resources. We must incubate them and protect them to secure their ability as resources. We should not consider them to be the possession of their parents. We should identify them as the nation's human resources. For the goal of acquiring and raising children as healthy resources, we must protect them. This was the responsibility of the state. And indeed, as the film goes on, we see this attitude becoming more and more explicit in the aunt's rhetoric, just as it was in the story. She verbally wonders aloud why Seda isn't at the factories, since the school has been bombed out. The people around her marvel at how she's taken in these homeless children, and soon she resorts to ugly names. <laughs> And no, these names aren't just leveled at Seta. Setsuko is only four years old, and yet she is also targeted. And notice how she dresses her personal resentments in the language of the national good. Bear in mind again, this is a 15-year-old boy who has seen his mother not only killed, but horrifically mutilated. This is a girl, barely older than a toddler, who's seen her home wiped out in hellish flames. And all the while, the only question posited to them is, what more can they give? In a society structured like this, if you're not useful, you're discarded as useless. 
In 1938, the National Mobilization Law and National Service Draft allowed the Japanese state to draft civilian workers, including children, to produce food and ammunition. In 1943, all children older than 12 were required to offer their labor to the state. Tokyo Orphanage was seized and turned into a munitions factory. Its director, Kuroshima Masayoshi, pressed into service as a dorm father for the youth forced to work there. In 1944, the minimum age for conscription was lowered to 15, Seita's age. Imagine Seita being expected to bear arms and to kill for the glory of the chrysanthemum throne. David Saul arranges what he calls concentric circles of responsibility around the story. There is a local community who allowed their values to be corrupted by propaganda, who lose their empathy and turn their backs on the most vulnerable. Then there's the nation-state, its leaders and educators and bureaucrats and officers who engineered an empire that demanded only selfless sacrifice, who are unable to admit defeat or failure, instead demanding even more from the people, and then encompassing that in international sphere, which allowed wars to be waged in a way where non-combatants could be rationalized into legitimate targets. It's a cascading effect that entraps Seida and Setsuko, that trapped Nosaka and Keiko. But even as the Leviathan booms over their heads, Seida focuses only on trying to care for Setsuko. And this is a crucial element here. Despite the film's reputation for its tragic story, it does not wallow in misery. Seda tries everything he can to cultivate joy and respite. In the same Anne America interview I mentioned before, and even in the same sentence as his distaste for anti-war movies, Nosaka also iterates that he hates movies where the main character is placed into cruel situations for no other reason than to provide a cathartic focus for the audience's sympathy. It's remarkably easy to elicit cheap sympathy in a story by taking a child and having terrible, awful things happen to them. But Grave of the Fireflies manages to avoid this. David Stahl remarks that Takahata portrays Seda as an incarnation of love and creates warm scenes of joy through play and shared beauty, scenes that Nosaka didn't share with Keiko. Remember the moment I showed you before and how he tried to distract his sister from her sadness? Throughout their stay at their aunt's house, he does his best to comfort her, both in the written story and in the film. He gives her a ten of fruit drop candies, a detail that Takahata focused on in particular, remembering how hard candies were rationed during the war and thus craved by children. They go to the beach. Even if the outing is tainted by the discovery of another body, the looming threat still interrupting them. But he also takes her to a field in the cover of night, and there, they find fireflies. Fireflies. A motif important enough to be represented in the name of the short story. The humble firefly, of no particular use and yet of no particular harm either. It's one of the world's most beloved creatures for the way they glow, the way they bring simple and pure delight to those around them. And for a moment, the two siblings seem to forget their worries. But notice what happens with Setsuko here. She tries to close her fingers on one of the beetles and accidentally crushes it. Her naive attempt to claim it, to own it, has tragically killed it instead. And the motif comes back later. After the pair leave their ants and find their dugout shelter, they capture a jar full of fireflies and release them inside. It's another moment of joy that Seda is able to create for Setsuko. But in a similar way as the one crushed before, these fireflies are also doomed. Harnessed to be useful, Seda wakes in the morning to find them dead and his sister burying them in the titular grave. Why do fireflies have to die so soon? The humble firefly, one of the most beloved creatures in the world, killed precisely because of its most admired quality. Is this not a parallel for a child viewed merely as a future soldier? Innocence and youth taken as mere clay to be shaped by the people around them. The only concern is who they shall become instead of who they are. Their only value seen in their utility. This is what Seta wants to protect Setsuko from. He doesn't want her to feel the harsh edges of this world yet. He takes on the role as her caretaker, but even this effort ends in tragedy. Seta's raids for food get him beaten and nearly arrested. It's only a sympathetic officer who gets him off the hook. And when he's reunited with Setsuko, 
We see this experience has finally gotten through to him. His facade finally breaks down. And then... <laughs> she begins trying to take care of him. And his reaction is horror. In this moment, he realizes that he has failed to protect her and her innocence. At this moment, perhaps, he realizes that he isn't strong enough to save them. In 1943, the Japanese economy devoted 43% of its output to the war effort, while the United States devoted 42% of its output. But it's worth noting that the United States had over seven times the output of Japan in this year, despite having only twice the population. In 1944, Japan's war effort swelled to encompass 76%, over three quarters of the economy. With the state commanding so much, it's impossible for Seida and Setsuko to exist independently of it. And with so much going towards the war, there were barely table scraps for the rest of the Japanese people. I've already shown you these numbers before, but numbers are too clinical to tell the whole story. Numbers cannot show you how fallow land is brought to plow wherever it's found. <laughs> They cannot illustrate nearly as clearly as Seda trying to feed Setsuko ice shavings off the ground, because it's all he can find to fill her belly. It can't show the way she's soon too delirious to even eat, sucking on glass marbles just to have the sensation of anything in her mouth. And at this point, even when Seda has found food, it's far, far too late. Setsuko was not the same as the same as at night a storm, Seda crouched in the darkness of the shelter with Setsuka's body rested over his knees. Even when he dozed off, he soon awoke, rubbing over and over her hair, pressing his own cheek against her already cold cheek. He did not cry. The sun is bright when Seda receives the charcoal for the cremation. He's told to perform the ceremony at a temple to dress the body in bean stalks, and the man handing him the supplies remarks that it's a lovely day. And for some it is. We see a family returning to their house with the war now over, twittering about how good it feels to be home, that it hasn't changed a bit, that they missed the view from the balcony. For them, the war had been merely inconvenient, if even that much. They're eager to return to normal. For Seta, there is no normal to return to. He has no home to go back to, no mother waiting for him, no father steaming back to port. Seta ends the war with a last look at his sister before closing her makeshift coffin. There is no temple, there are no beanstalks. He has only the pyre, only the smoke, only Setsuko's body, and soon, not even that. Seta is truly alone in this world. He has nothing. To the people around him, he is nothing. In Japan, the Senso Koji weren't even tallied until 1948, three years after the conflict ended, the year after Nosaka left his cellmates behind. For all intents and purposes, they did not exist to the state, and a lot's left of Seda is dismissed as a mere nuisance to keep out of the public eye. But Nosaka's short story had ended here, with Seda's death and unceremonious cremation. Takahara continues the story further, letting them linger as spirits. Outside of Kobe, it comes now to the modern day. When I look at the high-rise buildings and super highways that were once just futuristic dreams, I see them amidst the ruins, and I think of the sun shining down on it all. Like the repetitive call of a bird, I return time and again to the burned-out ruins. One can't know the air raids without experiencing them. I know it's futile to think that others will understand, but I will say this. Children suffer most in war. The expression on the faces of famished Nigerian children, Jewish children in Auschwitz, and Vietnamese children was no different from that of my sister who died of malnutrition. What crime did those children who starved to death there commit? Adults were responsible for the war, and if there is another war, it will be our fault. Complacently living as we do in peace and prosperity, we naturally think that war has nothing to do with us. But one misstep, war breaks out, and women and children suffer. 
Grave of the Fireflies succeeds as a harrowing depiction of people stuck within rings upon rings of machinations. They're surrounded by a callous community, engineered by a nationalist regime, embroiled in a war where lives are numbers in a tactical report. It's a film that acts as a grim warning, a reminder that war is more than just its violence. It's an exploitation of the most vulnerable people in our world. It's a film that was very personal to Nosaka. Since the end of the war, Osaka had been afraid of approaching Manjidani, the place where he and Keiko had lived with the widow. But during the production, he personally led the animation team there. He said that, I had continued to avert my eyes from the mirror that reflected my true image. Now, I am confronting my past more honestly. In 1988, Nosaka wrote further, I received a video copy of the trailer, and late at night after some fairly heavy drinking, I watched it alone. Although I knew it was animation, I was somehow brought back 43 years. Watching just a few opening scenes kept me crying until dawn. Akiyuki Nosaka was laid to rest in 2015.